Hello everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Music Works. Today we are honoured to have a very special guest, Claire Barnett-Jones, one of the most sought after mezzo-sopranos in the operatic stage and winner of the Dame Joan Sutherland Audience Prize at BBC Cardiff Singer of the World 2021. In this episode we will discuss the gender pay gap in opera and how the whole industry could benefit from changing the traditional male-dominated approach to the art. We'll shortly head over to the Music Works studio where Claire is waiting, but first, here is an advert from our sponsor. Music Works is sponsored by the Musicians' Union. I'm a member of the Musicians' Union. It's the trade union for musicians living and or working in the UK, and it's a community of 32,000 members working to protect musicians' rights and campaigning for a fairer industry, as well as campaigning to fix streaming and keep musicians working in the EU post-Brexit the union collectively bargains for musicians working in orchestras and theatres and sets minimum recommended rates for freelance musicians working in other sectors. Its expert staff provide contract advice, legal advice and assistance and a range of benefits and services to help musicians in every aspect of their work. Be part of something bigger and get the recognition you deserve. Join now at the MU.org. Hi Claire, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So today we have Claire Barnett-Jones, mezzo-soprano, and we are here to talk about the gender pay gap in opera. And first of all, Claire, please do tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a mezzo-soprano, as you said. I am originally from Somerset in the southwest. I am uh, currently in France, working in Toulouse, doing Yeshu Baba in the South at the border. So that's very exciting at the moment. And as everybody, the last couple of years have been interesting. Um, plenty of lows, but also some highs. And in the last you know, two years, um, I was thrust into kind of the, the spotlight with uh, with being last minute at Cardiff Singer of the World and then becoming a finalist and winning the Dame Jane Sutherland Audience Prize. So it's been quite a whirlwind for a couple of years, but yes, now back working again, which is great. Absolutely, and congratulations on that—a a huge Thank achievement, you. and um, particularly in the backdrop of the uh, of as you say the last two years and COVID and everything else that's gone on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we uh, we had a conversation a while ago about about this, and I, I really wanted to bring you onto the podcast to talk about it. So you've got a very interesting perspective as you're um, in your kind of current career stage and the way you're experiencing the world of opera. So do you want to tell us a bit about about your stance on this? Yes. Yeah, so so I started working. Um, in the opera industry, well, my first professional contract was in 2010, um, doing some chorus in some Gilbert and Sullivan, which is great fun. Um, and then since then, I've worked at lots of different places uh, in the UK and abroad. And the thing that has always made me, I don't know, feel a bit more questioning about the industry as a whole is the work that we kind of perform on a uh, on a basis where it's kind of mainstream and uh and the the works that kind of come up a lot are the verdi the puccini's the mozart things that were written by men a long time ago really um that aren't work that at the time reflects what today society is about and it's always made me kind of question also that there are so many more, this is, I mean, let's start at the idea that there are more roles in opera for men than women. I mean, that is the first point, that in the opera that is performed mostly, there are more roles for men than women, which is, today in today's world, taking aside how many people of what gender go into opera, there, there's just, it, that isn't relative for society today. Mm. And 
I mean, for, for example, I mean, the, the biggest example to say is that in the top 10 performed operas in the world, uh, there are um, 40 principal roles for women and 80 principal roles for men. So that's a third for women and two thirds for men, which is just, yeah, not relative to a 51% in the world. Full. And this is being very binary, um, which obviously uh, is also uh, another aspect of that. But well, if the, you think uh, in binary terms, just for the, this the, the representation of any other gender than male and female in opera is a whole other, <laughs> um, whole other minefield yeah. that's uh, that's even further behind by, you know, untold lengths. So yeah, I think. Totally. Uh, no, I know it's hard to talk about. Um, the two genders but I think in this context it's probably relevant because it's the uh, the only comparison that we have at this point yes yes and I started kind of thinking about soprano mezzo baritone uh baritone tenor bass roles the fact that also within the categorization it's very often that you will have in the um male voice types tenor baritone bass baritone bass which are very very standard names whereas in the in the fact that women are usually seen as soprano and mezzo occasionally can translate, but that is such mm. a rare voice type that but it's not really talked about. So uh, yeah, in the top in the top ten operas, that that for me is and um, the top ten performed. I'm so sorry, they're not like the best. Yeah, <laughs> not the top ten according to Claire. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> but they are. Uh, but that is. Um, yeah, that is a questioning point. And that's worldwide. So that's not specifically mm. of the UK or, or whatever. Sure. And how can this change, really, is always my kind of back, my questioning point. And I've always gone to an opera and thought, why does that role have to be a man? Or why does it have to be performed by somebody that has a lower voice type? Or, um, I, mean, this, I mean, that's a very general point, and that's really up to a director. However, it's not specific, and in theatre it changes. In TV nowadays, that, that changes in in lots of different things. But that is one way that could change it. Uh, yeah. That's interesting because I was assuming that the uh, you know that the number one change point you were going to mention would be to just program different operas. But you're not even asking opera houses to change their top ten. Uh... <laughs> Well, you know, most popular <laughs> operas. <laughs> I'm definitely not not saying that. That definitely yeah. needs to change as well. Uh, but the more that we look at uh, opera companies coming out of the pandemic, um, or you know, re-emerging into your world, which is different, most opera companies obviously need to protect their finances, which we all completely understand. And if the audience seems at this point to want to go to operas that they know and love and know the stories to and know the famous arias, great. We need to make sure that they are programmed at some point in every season to make sure that the company, the opera, the art form survives. However, this is becoming a, has become a lot more relevant since in the last you know, 21, 22 seasons. I, mean, I don't know how many times I've seen Labo M being put on by, I think, every single opera company in the last year. But you, when you look at the, the roles that are available to women and men, there are two female roles in Labo M, and there are eight, I think, I believe, seven for men. Yeah. And... So thinking about the ways in which this could change, then, and so we, as you say, we understand the financial um, constraints on opera houses and yeah. um, and the need to rebuild. And the the challenge in the um, in this industry is that we tend to only have data about the things because we have such a narrow repertoire across the classical music industry in general. We only have data about the popular works, so it's very understandable. Yeah. So I, I, again, I, I I'm sort of pondering in my mind which is more of a, a diversion and more of a risk for opera houses to program different works or to change the genders of the people of seeing the roles in the major works or a combination of you know, the top 10 works or a combination of both. There's just so many different ways in which this can be done. To what extent do you think opera houses are, are thinking about, you know, saying I'm doing Labo M 
that means we've got a massive deficit in female roles within that opera. What can I do with the rest of the season to to balance that? Do you think that goes on? <clears throat> I don't know. It, I can't. There's so much that that we don't know what goes that goes on, and perhaps it is. Um, yeah. However, at the moment, programming new work or work that is seen as a risk is not really being done by a lot of companies, understandably. And but there are, I mean, even in the kind of repertory operas that there are, there are operas that could be put on that would close that um, working. And it really is, in a way, it is a pay gap between um, women and men because Mm -hmm. if you don't have the opportunities for work, I mean, I think when I think about, um, say, my undergraduate studies, all my postgraduate studies in terms of how many people went into the training sphere of conservatoires or, or use music colleges or university whatever your path was it was 75 percent women and 25 percent men so if you think that the 25 percent and these are the ones that start out so how many we lose along the way because of lots of different elements is, is another topic as well but 25 percent of the workforce as it were are taking 75 percent of the job or yeah. there are 75% of the jobs available for 25% of the workforce. Which means that uh, it means that there's always going to be a plus for those those people playing those roles because they can negotiate higher fees. They can uh, have more opportunities for work and a fuller diet, for example, because they need those, those singers. And that kind of then leads on to how much are we getting paid? Um, it's one of the, I, I presume, one of the only industries where we've got no idea what the person standing next to us doing our job is being paid, whereas most industries will have a industry standard and you've got an idea that this this job um, in an office is between this and this. And you know that that person will be paid around that. Whereas we've, I mean, the only example that I have is a lot, a lot further back in my career, um, a colleague of mine uh, volunteered the fact that they were being paid, um, which which we're told we shouldn't talk about. However, I think in this day and age, we want to make sure that everybody's being paid fairly. And if we have no idea what somebody's being paid, you know, so he volunteered that he was being paid X amount for a show. In a similar role type, it was a supporting role, and and the similar stat. It wasn't like he was ten years older than me along the line. He was being paid four times as much as me per show. Wow. Yeah. And not only do you then question. I mean, this goes into the realms of a singer's life and and mental health and self worth and things like that. However, you the base is that you are probably going to have to pay the same amount of rent, maybe a similar amount of rent, and you don't have the same amount of money for the same job that you're doing for somebody else. And I don't know how that can be regulated because it really is down to your agent or the person pushing for it or just, yeah. And I think things are slightly different nowadays, I hope. Well, I hope so too. Um, yeah, I mean, how you stop that is is um, outside any one person's control, isn't it? But, you know, I think the, the, the issue you raise about transparency and not talking about fees is, um, is an interesting one, isn't it? Because there's the very obvious side to that, which is that it's protective of... It allows organisations to um, offer unequal fees to people and to carry on doing that with impunity because no one talks about it um but it also feeds quite neatly into um a money mindset issue that exists across the industry which is that in general in music we struggle to talk about money because we have this undercurrent of you know we all do it for the art and we love it so much and we're so lucky to you know do 
six hours of rehearsals for weeks on end and then set performances every night of the week and then you know yeah. you know ultimately as you say everyone has the same amount of costs and everyone really should have um I think that everyone should be paid the same, obviously, um, for like equivalent pieces of work. But also the fact that this then immediately goes to worry about personal value is quite a um, it's a it's a, a particular thing, I think, to creative industries, because it's because there is no pay structure. There is no, you know, you yeah. do X number of roles or X number of years in the industry and then you get a pay bump like that doesn't exist. So um it's very, very difficult for people not to see their value reflected in the fees they get, which is very damaging, as you say. Totally. And I think there's, when you were saying about the the costs that people have, and I mean, even if we go back to the starting block, say, of, and I'm, I'm, I can really only speak about opera singers, but I know it, this also happens in with directors, designers, creatives, it, any other creative avenue in opera, Perhaps I'll touch on that later, but when you, if you are able to be a young artist at, say, an, an opera house, usually that means that you will have quite a few supporting roles. And if, as there are more male support, supporting roles in uh, the opera industry, usually the, the young artist programmes in Europe or in the UK or in the state will take more men than women. Mm. But that also means that you, from the start, have a salaried position. It's not, I mean, in general, it's not mega bucks, but it is a consistent income that you can then create budgets with. You can, if you're savvy about it, you could, you've got a pay slip that you can go to a mortgage provider and say, I have this amount of money coming in for at least two years. Please give me a mortgage because I've got money from, I don't know, a, a relative passing away or whatever. You can then buy a house, which and as we know at the moment, the rising costs of rental is not equivalent to being on the mortgage, being on the housing market with a mortgage. So you're already in a position at, in your mid twenties or mid late twenties of not having that security, and you're already, you know, ten years down the line, not in the same position. So it really does start very much from the beginning of your opera career that you are automatically put into a position of um, being second class to yeah. the people singing the male roles. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, ultimately it's inequalities like this that push people out of the industry. Yeah. Um, which is a real, real crisis for the industry. And the other side of this that I'm thinking of as well in terms specifically of the imbalance due to programming is the um, the audience crisis as well, which is, of course, massively, it's all tied in together because audiences pay for the to see the performances and then the opera houses have money and then they can yeah. program things. And the more money they have, the more, the, crea- the more creative freedom they have. And to just to come back to something you said right at the beginning, uh, you said that these, you know, these key, these 10, top 10 operas or, the, you know, and the top 50 operas, they're all historic and very few of them contain themes that are particularly relatable today. So, you know, some of them can be reimagined like anything can, but like essentially um, as we move into a world where people are more and more aware of various issues that can face them and, you know, gender and sexuality and inclusivity and, and so on and so forth being part of it, people don't want to watch outdated misogynistic um, patriarchal, art forms anymore um so you know this is a real threat to the to the music industry in general i think and particularly in opera because these these plots are ridiculous you know (laughs) yeah yes and we really uh, some companies are doing really well at attracting the audiences but it's not just about attracting them it's about keeping them Mm. and if you've attracted somebody that's gone, oh, actually, I'd like to go out for the evening to the opera, and they go and see Carmen, for example. If that Carmen doesn't relate to them, it's very unlikely they'll then come back. Yeah. Or if, I mean, Carmen's actually a quite good example because Carmen, is, well, it depends how it's done, but Carmen's such a strong character that you can go, actually, maybe that does link in. But she is also squashed by men in every avenue so that there's and and again that's a very even the women within the operas that happen are completely you know 
are a, a product of the society that they live in and the men that are around them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just looking down even the top 25 operas. There is, no, I mean, there's nothing performed that is written after kind of 19, 1905. Yeah, I think as well, we're making excuses for, for these operas here as well. And I know why we're doing it, because, you know, I adore opera and I presume that yeah. you also adore opera. Yeah. And so, you know, we're all very happy to see some Carmen and some Labo and, and, and so on and so forth, because, you know, lots of like good things about it. But if I think about an art form that I'm less invested in, I mean, like even my consumption of my personal consumption of films has completely changed recently. I now if I go on Netflix to look for a film, if it's before like 2018 at the very earliest uh I'm sort of like oh I don't think so because I just think it's not going to yeah. feel like I mean that's a, a broad there are exceptions but like I just think you know I'm sort of like I want to see something that's been made by someone who's thinking right now about things and so if you're not into opera yeah you know you might as you say you might go and think well that was fine but I won't go back because it's not really for me but what you certainly won't get is is a sort of feeling of like, oh, I've just found this art form and it just speaks for me and it's now my new passion. Yeah. I don't think. Not, you know, to speak for myself. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think there's also a... We need new work, definitely, within the industry. There are... At least now there is a big push towards making sure that any... The composers that are getting premieres of new works are more diverse in every aspect which is great and because that if we don't have the diversity of this amazing world on the stage then then it's not an art form for everybody uh but we also then need to make sure that they are still accessible for people that maybe are, are new to opera so sometimes the new work that happens is not then accessible to a new opera audience yeah, and so we do need to draw them in with the standard that they hear on adverts that they hear with the tunes. Go, oh, I recognise that from I don't know, perfume advert, advert or something. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think it is an art form that people like long-standing opera audiences do go back for for repetition, so that they do. Um, it's because not all art forms are like that are they no. but people do like to go and see the same things once they are into it they do like to hear the same tunes over and over again and and, and see different productions of the same operas so it's there, there's so much in the way the industry works that that just kind of all goes into the melting pot of this challenge but it's it's so different from say if you want to go and see a musical at the west end people for example want to see the wicked that they know they never yeah. want you know when how often are there new productions of musicals? I mean, it really yeah, isn't. That's true. But people go back and see it, and they and they really like that. And I think sometimes, perhaps, if we think about, I mean, money saving as a general point within opera, then there needs to be maybe more repetition of the operas that that sell, the productions that sell. And so often you'll see an amazing production, and then it's you know you hear it's been axed, and you go, mm. why? That's great. Can we not do that one again in a few years? Yeah, you know, I'd yeah. like to see that one again. Yeah, um, mm. And I f yes, I feel like every industry, arts industry specifically, is really trying to tackle how we go forward. And the cost of living isn't helping. And uh, prioritising where people spend their money is also important, obviously. Mm. however it doesn't it still doesn't help when people say opera is expensive or elitist or that because as we know it, it isn't the base of it isn't but people also like it to be different as well so uh, there's yeah there's such a there are such a lot of moving parts aren't there and I think what's what's been really interesting for me about this conversation is the way in which the complexities of the opera programming challenge and the audience challenge and the challenges that um, singers face as they move through their career all ties into this fiscal issue of um, of pay and you know it's not just about how much an opera contract is worth it's about how many there are and it's about how yeah. 
the various and myriad of ways that people could that that um, opera companies and those making programming decisions can uh, can impact that. Yeah. And I do want to say because I haven't said this yet that I do I am aware that there is a vast amount of progressive thought going on in the opera world and a lot of new opera and yeah. a lot of opera companies doing really wonderful productions of historic operas and new operas that are um that are absolutely um totally. great and really really valuable art and and do address this so I'm not meaning to be kind of like it's not happening at all I do realize that it is no, <laughs> but no, it is totally. still I think sometimes and again this I sometimes fall foul of this because I work so deeply in the world of of inclusivity and and new music and so on that I sometimes it's useful to take a step back and go despite the fact that all of this is going on these overall statistics are still true so there are there is still a top 10 of very very frequently performed operas that create I can't remember the uh, the statistic you gave were essentially two-thirds of the roles are for men that even in this world in which so much good work is being done that still exists yeah yeah Yeah. and that and that's really hard to kind of um to think about because it's I don't know how that how that changed um that also leads on to the creatives within the opera industry as well because yes yeah there's there was a study that i found um from 2021 so recent which is great um by caitlin vincent who um is a lecturer in melbourne and there it was based on one opera company uh in the uk but it was based on how many of their creatives are um, that there was a pledge that it would be 50 by 2022. Now that that was done in 2019, and there's been a pandemic since then. However, 90% of their directors are still men for their opera productions, which this is definitely not saying that men can't relate to women's issues or, or, or issues that relate to women. But you do then question what is being slightly portrayed. We don't, we only know our lived experience and we can empathise, definitely. But that only 10% are by female directors still is quite, in the opera industry, is quite um, quite damning really on the fact that the rest of the arts industry has a lot more gender diversity um gender equality so in in that um but the of the one of, and we're talking about new opera but of the operas that were directed by women um or the, the opportunities that the women were given for directing opera it was mainly the new work that they were given uh the one-off pieces the things that may not come back whereas most of the standards repertory was directed by men or revival and that's the other thing that it what that isn't quite put in I know that I've seen some things a lot on Twitter or whatever saying there's not enough women directors in this season for this opera company that's because a lot of them are revivals because they know that they're already built and they sell and that there is a back catalogue of opera that needs to be still seen because it's paid for already it's yeah, Super absolutely, good. and there are huge econ- um, environmental and economic reasons for doing revivals beyond the artistic yeah. reasons as well. So yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. But also within their teams, making sure that there are creators within the director's team that are also, you know, you, the fact you need that as well. You can't just be an all male team. Because... Yeah, and and it can't be that all the time as well because you know I hear yeah. what you're saying about, you know, no one is saying that any individual male director cannot accurately or, or like emp- empathetically yeah. portray a woman's experience but again we're talking about the the big statistics aren't we and the and the way yeah. this is shown and the the importance of representation um is just becoming clearer and clearer all the time i don't know if you've been following the story um in the press about the the little mermaid film um yeah. th- as we're recording this this week the um there's been a an announcement about the little mermaid film that's coming out soon with the uh, with Ariel, the lead character, being played by a black actor, and it is um, you know there's a, a million and a half apparently complaints being made um, oh, about God. about this casting, and then there's also as 
like thankfully and as you can imagine a huge outpouring from everyone else in the world saying how important it is for their children to see uh, themselves to see this you know disney character yeah. represented and so on and so forth and you know this this there's some of the things that I've read have said, you know, this uh, the casting announcement was made years ago. This isn't even new news. I think the no. trailer's been released and that's what's caused it. Um, you know, so we do we do still live in a world where the importance of representation isn't completely understood at all. No. Um, and actually, when you just saying about the fact that things are, so, are planned so far in advance, I mean, I think it's really important to to say that in the opera industry, this is like two, three, four years in advance of these yeah. castings. So the what we're talking about now, in a way, won't be seen for a few years. And people that well, there's not enough going in done. Well, no, there is, but it really is just going to take its time to mm. to be able to be seen. And and there's also questions around around diversity as well within this there's people saying there's not enough diversity or like you're saying there's too much of this <laughs> these complaints being made well mm. also if people don't apply for certain things and in, in the same way you can't if somebody doesn't apply for a job and then they say there's not that diversity well they can't just find somebody for the job i mean it, it, this is again for audition purposes for maybe mm. younger young artists program but it's a very yeah, it's a very difficult field to kind of talk about and and try and see what is there's no what is right and what is wrong. Mm. However, we need to make sure we still keep talking about what is happening and what is being seen to be happening or not. I think that's exactly it. And I think in terms of I do like to when we talk about knotty problems on this podcast, I do always like to chat to, to sort of have a think about the solutions. Uh, and we've talked quite a bit about things that um that opera companies can do and that um can be done within the industry but i think what you've just said is you know and you know we can't solve this the two of us here today is it is extremely yeah. naughty and complicated but it does feel as though a major influencing factor is just the fact that people are thinking about it so even yeah. if someone is thinking what does this mean you know what does this mean for pay what does this mean for gender equality what does this mean for representation and making decisions with that as one of the criteria alongside all of the other components that i think is uh you know is the the one thing that we can <laughs> request of everyone yeah. yeah and i just also think back to kind of the composers who are writing at the time that they're composing i mean out of the top 10 operas that are performed the most equal in terms of gender uh, are Mozart operas. And you think about the way that Mozart wrote, he wasn't, you know, aristocratic or, or you know, he was he wanted to do stuff of the people. Mm. And, you know, in Figaro, for example, Antonio doesn't, Antonio has such few lines, he doesn't need to be played by a man because in today's productions, you have female gardeners. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. and that's the... That's what would happen in theatre. I mean, mm. what in the eighties there was uh, a female Henry V. Like, yeah. if that if that was happening then, how are we? And it seems that somebody was talking to me recently about it. Seems like the Open Street it is twenty years behind the rest of theatre TV. Yeah, but it is getting it is getting there and quickly, which is great. Um, but in terms of pay, it doesn't help somebody's mortgage. It doesn't help somebody's <laughs> living costs. That's bottom line, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, uh, that, that also thinking about the way that the cost of living and the, uh, in general has risen dramatically in the last, what, 10, 5, 10 years. But thinking about contracts that I maybe have in the next two, three years that have already been signed based on today's cost costings, not only for the opera company, are the productions going to cost more in the next because of lots of different factors, mm. but when you're being paid X amount for a, or you've signed a contract, but you realise that doesn't cover your rent at that point in two years' time because it's changing so much. Is there a question mark to have over renegotiating contracts due to worldly events and things like that? I don't know whether that's something that 
should maybe be talked about. I think, well, I think it should. And it's interesting. I had a conversation with someone about a, a similar topic the other day to do with... Um, it was to do with this. I was talking to them about the way that composers make money, or um, and and the various sort of income streams there. And the the conversation went to sort of the challenges of essentially what you end up doing when you're trying to bring more money into this industry is that you quite often end up move trying to move money around parties that have no money. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, which is a, just a huge challenge for the industry. I think you know the in general the. Um, I mean, to use the example that I've started, this is, is somewhat off topic, but um, it was to do with um, diversity of programming for chamber music clubs. So the idea being that um, if chamber music clubs wanted to pay more for their performers and perhaps commission works and sort of to, in order to bring more new music into that repertoire, um, where they would get that from would be their audiences usually or possibly grant funding but you know to use this the, the basic economic model of like you know i present music and people pay for it and that yeah. all works and then you know we have the dwindling audiences problem so they go oh we can't do that and then you end up with sort of situations where they're asking people to do things for less or um they're not commissioning new works or they're not um, you know, to sometimes not even performing works that are in copyright because to avoid the PRS bill, yeah. which is, of course, the entire opposite of what the point of the PRS yeah. bill is. Um, so this it was this sort of like idea of like, where does the new money come in to the industry? Yeah. So, yeah, I think this, um, there is no uh, I, I offer no solution to this whatsoever, sadly. But, yeah, the if opera companies are going to, you know, set their costs, uh, the festival that I organised last month, the costs were astronomically higher even from having budgeted it for it in January and then delivered it in yeah. July. There was a huge cost difference for things like transport, for things like equipment, um, yeah. freelance hire of, like our, the technical staff had had to massively increase their quote because their costs had all gone up. So yeah, these, these costs on an opera company scale will be huge. Um, yeah. And you're right, ethically and just for the purposes of people being able to work in the industry, it should be possible to renegotiate or to kind of address things like yeah. enormous cost of living rises. But it, yeah, it's a yeah. real challenge to yeah. work out how, how this all works economically. Totally. And I think there's a there's also a question to be had, and I don't think it's been talked about enough, but is how many people we lose mm. along the way due to... I mean, at firstly, due to the fact that people, if you come from a background like I did, where I, you know, my parents are very working class, we, I went to a state school, I didn't see, I don't, I don't have that financial backing, mm. but actually in the opera industry, in terms of singers, you do need to have, or you need to work extremely hard to be able to kind of like knock on doors that, you can't afford to go and spend six hundred pounds on one audition to not know that you're not going to get it. That's just not viable. And people think about you know diversity. We need more diversity in the opera industry. Sometimes they only talk about one side of diversity, but we also need to make sure that actually most people in the opera industry come from an element of of wealth, or um, otherwise they wouldn't have had music lessons paid for. Because that's not exactly. Yeah. So the whole economics goes right the way back to education. You yeah. Need, you need money to do music unless you're very very lucky with some kind of yeah. state provision. You need you always need money to do music. You need it for networking. You need it yeah. for lessons. You need it for auditions. You need it for travel. You need it to support you while you work for free. It's <laughs> like as much yeah. as I always advocate against doing that, it's just one of the realities. Yeah. And no wonder, and then this then goes back to the, the the idea that there are fewer roles for women because they don't, they're fighting for the same job. You've got so not fight, fighting is not the right word, but it is, you, you're fighting to survive in this world yeah. and you need money to do that. And if you've gone down the path of opera, then if you don't have the money if you're not getting the money in, you will work for cheaper thinking that it is an exposure type 
and that will just then spiral down because there's always somebody going to be there that will do it either <laughs> cheaper or if you say no i'm not doing that they will find somebody that will do it they will always because they, yeah there that. is always someone willing to do it and that yeah it's very very difficult to break that cycle for sure yeah well, this has been a really great chat. I feel like we could carry on for ages, but I think <laughs> on that note, <laughs> yeah. what do we, how should we round off? What, I think what that, you... I think the thing is, is the, if you can go and buy tickets to see things, I think anybody in any industry, I mean, you can, if you think I'm going to go out for a nice meal, which will cost, say, I don't know, 70 quid for two people or whatever, you can get an opera and a meal for that rather yeah. than, you know, you could go to a slightly less expensive place, but still have the idea of going out and going to see an opera. Yeah. So I think it's about saying, prioritising what we need in, in the world. And if we can learn anything from the pandemic to try and think back to what we were craving for, for the time that we couldn't see people was art. It wasn't, it, it wasn't kind of, I don't know, there's so many things that we missed. People were watching things online more than ever. And if you're watching Netflix for hours a day, you can go and watch an opera for three hours. It's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not that long. Well, it's not just that. I mean, it's not, uh, one thing I would say is that um, what you get when you go to see opera is this, uh, it's same, and lots of art forms, but opera in particular is you almost always get a lot of people pouring an enormous amount of energy and artistry and creativity and beauty and passion into something that's right yeah. there in a room um, and it's completely electric. And I think this is, uh, for me, one of the things that I miss the most in the pandemic. And, you know, yeah. I, I completely echo the sentiment, always go and see something live if you can, because I personally missed the energy that I received from people like you standing on a stage and just making incredible things yeah. happen so much. And it is it is a completely different experience from watching anything on a screen. Um, yeah. And, uh, and always worth a visit. For certain, for certain. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire, for your analysis and discussion on such an important and delicate topic. It's clear that the gender gap is an issue that must be tackled immediately in a way that brings both equality among differently gendered singers and directors and a modern approach that represents a sustainable income to opera houses. Some of the steps that opera houses can take to address the gap are programming newer and different operas, uh, providing more job opportunities for female and non-binary opera directors and modifying existing famous operas to feature the same roles played by different genders. Additionally, there are also individual actions that can help the industry move forwards. Among these are being open about our salaries in order to start building an industry standard in terms of payment and destigmatizing artistic jobs as ones that are performed just for passion without the need for fair remuneration. Finally, if audiences want to contribute as well, then please do so by purchasing tickets to see and support opera, especially alternative new and female and non-binary operatic productions been such a privilege to have you here Claire and thank you so much for your time and your honest analysis of the current gender issues within the opera industry. Thank you for inviting me it's been great thank you. <laughs>